Hi, Jennifer. So we're going to be talking about embodied research methodology. Do you mm -hmm. want to mention a little bit what it's about? Ah, um, so embodied research methodologies uh, seems to have emerged from from two places. Uh, first, um, you know, we have our typical quantitative studies, qualitative studies, arts-based research is starting to develop. And um, from when I wrote my dissertation, I started realizing that as I was interviewing my, uh, my participants, um, they were, just as I'm doing right now, using gestures, using eye gaze, all the things that we look at as therapists in our practice, in somatic psychology practice, uh, I started noticing as part of the research process. And uh, my topic was very obscure. I was looking at uh, clinical intuition and how therapists experienced intuition while working with clients. So it's a very difficult thing to talk about. And what I found was that when therapists were trying to describe what they were saying, they were using posture different movements and different pauses um, in their descriptions. And what I was finding that it was beside the words that they were saying were the movements were telling me more information even when they were saying, I don't know how it happened. So what they were saying was different from what they were doing. And I started becoming curious about that. And I started realizing that, um, that this work that we do as clinicians and what we pay attention to in our sessions in addition to what's being said is also how people convey information through their bodies. So I took the, um, the second part of what I was starting to say is that, you know, that we have quantitative, qualitative, arts-based and embodied research uh, and the, the embodied research is partly a continuation of that and it's also based in um, how we work as clinicians. So it's taking a clinical practice and turning it into a research method. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you allow me a little summary of what I'm hearing to check that we're on the same wavelength, that if we just listen to the words of what people say, we have incomplete information. And uh, that we know as clinician, but is not necessarily reflected in research methods. And so this approach is about, uh, you know, benefiting from the experience as clinicians in order to enrich uh, what you can study in research. That's right. Yeah, you said it better than I did. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Yeah, so, um, so there seems to be uh, many ways of doing that. And um, so I'm starting to investigate and pull in other uh, researchers from other disciplines and all over in different countries who are investigating what embodiment in research really means and, and what it means to collect and analyze the data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and what's been uh, your, your impression so far based on what you've gotten out of this call for papers? Well, I was uh, very humbled and surprised and, and not surprised, but um, I guess altogether a feeling of complete gratitude that embodiment is not just something that we do in uh, clinical practice. It's not just somatic psychotherapy. It's not just dance movement therapy. But people are including the body and the value of embodied, as I call it, embodied data, what we can derive and uh, record from an embodied experience. Um, it's, it's happening in all different pockets all over the world and you know I had uh, so far I'm, I'm still kind of sifting through the call for the the, um, the uh, proposals that I've received um, I was told you know maybe 20 chapters for the book embodied research methods and um, I received 45 proposals mm -hmm. in addition to the five to ten um, uh, theoretical chapters uh, for of the individuals who I invited to write chapters. So um, it, it's really astonishing how much embodiment is seen and understood in 
different places all over the world and, and how it's being studied that um, it, it just, it, it, it sounds me. I just, I'm so excited to, to be learning about how other people see embodiment. And it's not just, uh, you know, how the embodied mind is, uh, oh, the, the body is a map for the brain, or it, it's not just a servant of the brain, but actually has its own experience and can produce new knowledge that we couldn't get through through words alone. Right, right. But so, so you're, you're alluding to really a major shift in model that we're not, you know, just creating this little homunculus that's, uh, you know, again, creating a sense of the will or, you know, uh, inside a, a little puppet, you know, but is really something that the body, the whole body, the whole organism has a logic of its own uh, that cannot be reduced to that little uh, uh, particle. Yeah, yeah. And that it's, it's worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we all have a body. Uh, and we all have such, you know, we have access to the internet, so embodiment is, you know, accessible to people, the concept of embodiment, and people are running with it. And I've had proposals from uh, departments of anthropology, education, osteopathy, performance studies, nursing, of course, so psychology and social science. Uh, it's just really, really astonishing how... Um, there's a common knowledge that seems to be there's like a thread through uh, this term of embodiment that is inherently understood, but right now is only like you know little smatterings around uh, around the globe. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, it's really uh, it feels like a real honor to be able to bring everything together into one volume that can be like, hey, look at this. This yeah. is something that uh, has been existing. And, uh, and and here it is all together. Hey, this might be something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, as therapists uh, who are interested in embodied life and the embodied mind and, you know, embodied behavior and somatic psychotherapy, um, we are, we bring in a point of view in, uh, you know, dealing with our clients. And it's very powerful to see that this point of view of what it's like to be a human being is shared by a large number of disciplines so it's a it's a it's a it's a view uh, that is not just uh, ours it's not parochial right right it, it's it's very exciting and 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 I've, I've also you know I've seen some chapters where people kind of the, the traditional way of saying talking about embodiment, they talk about it, but don't actually connect it to an experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on the other hand of what you're saying, um, I guess my biased opinion or view is from a psychology perspective that we really get in there and find the actual experience. Um, I guess what I'm saying is uh, this is also connected to uh, at least two different methodologies that I'm familiar with right now with collecting and analyzing embodied experience and one is of a descriptive nature and one is of an interpretive nature. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of borrowing from qualitative but then taking it a step further into present moment experience. So do you want to elaborate a little bit on these two approaches? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm co-authoring a chapter uh, in a upcoming uh, dance therapy research volume, and um, my it, it's I, I really enjoy the fact that you know so I, I, my um, method is based in descriptive. Uh, so I'll, I'll just talk about that first, and then I'll talk about hers. Um, my my idea about description came from reading about researchers interpreting the information from their um, participants and so a participant would say something like I don't know it's like and they would do something like this and then the researcher would say oh it's kind of like a globe right and the participant would go uh yeah so what happens there is that the researcher jumped in a little too soon mm -hmm interpreted what they saw of what this is and it left the participant just agreeing with the researcher. Mm 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in a somatic, somatic psychology situation, you know, we would say, I see you're doing something like this. What? Take a moment and, and keep doing that. What is what? What does that feel like? What is that for you? And then the participant gives their description of what their experience is. So the descriptive method is more about really describing what is happening. The hands come together like this and uh, form a rounded sphere. The participant described as da 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 da. So it's the participant's interpretation, but it's also their experience. So I wanted to get as close to the data as possible, as close to the experience of the participant as possible without my interrupted interpretation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in, in a somatic or any kind of psychotherapy process, I would hope, uh, you know, you don't want the therapist to interfere with the participant or the client's experience. So that's how that kind of aligns a little bit right, with, right. Um, so um, really staying with the description, staying with the participant's present moment experience, even if they're talking about something that happened before. What's happening right now? How are you describing this to me? And there will be what's happening. Yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, and that, my, my method was based on uh, Georgie's descriptive, phenomenological, psychological analysis, uh, a combination of that and Jenlin's uh, focusing process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the other uh, method, which is an, I hope I get this right, uh, is more of an interpretive method. It actually, and in, I'm going to kind of go back and forth between talking about the clinical experience and how that translates to the research experience. Yeah. Um, when a client is describing something, they describe it in words, there's an experience, kind of a qualitative base, start describing their experience, then put it into movement, put it into a nonverbal, more feeling state of what it feels like to move their words. What that does is open up another kind of like an iceberg kind of thing where the words are here and then underneath there's all this other information that becomes revealed. So the participant moves their words, moves their experience. After talking about it, they then move. And then the researcher moves as a response to the participant's movement. Mm -hmm. So this starts to sound like it's kind of spinning out, but actually what it does is bring them closer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the researcher moves, dances, their response to the participant's movement. The participant is witnessing the mm -hmm. researcher moving. And then the witness or the participant can then say, Oh, yes, that's what it is. Or no, that's, that's not right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's something shared. So it is more of a uh, constructivist, uh, more along the lines of Sharma's maybe, co-constructed uh, research study. Uh, and it's more on the lines of interpretive. It's an interpretive study because the participant then moves their words, which is an interpretation, the researcher then moves their interpretation of the participant's movement, but then something else is, is uh, learned and derived from that experience. Right, right. Hope oh, that's right. <laughs> so, 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 um, you know, I uh, want to maybe play that back. Uh, the, the first one was pretty easy in the sense that it's very similar to mm. um, what we do much of the time. Uh, yes. which is to not jump to prematurely interpret. And if we sometimes offer interpretation, it's more with a question mark and an inviting, you know, as opposed to giving something that, that implies that that's it and, and, and reduces the possibility for the client to check their own experience. Mm -hmm. um, the second approach you describe, you know, I see in it something that feels like essentially taking advantage of the fact that things happen in a shared field and so, for instance, when you see a demo uh, and you have uh, somebody doing a demo and the client, 
you know, the experience inside the field of the demo is very different from what, say, the audience can see because you're not as much in the same field. Yes. And what I'm hearing is when the, uh, the researcher actually um, explicitly introduces themselves in the field by, uh, you know, taking a part in it and playing, you know, his or her response, then in a way he or she is part of the field and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, the, the subjective biases introduced by that are acknowledged and then it's somebody's response that yes. the uh, you know that the uh, the client can respond to, and so it's right. part of the dialogue as opposed to being an intrusion. Beautifully put. Yes, exactly. So the connection between uh, the interp the two dances mm -hmm. uh, is also the way that it's really about the interpersonal exchange of information and what's shared. The uh, researcher's movement can be maybe aligned with the therapist's uh, counter transference. And, uh, and it can be worked with and mm -hmm. then created. And so, um, and then with the second one, there's also the interpretive method uh, is, um, by the way, it's by uh, Tomoyo Kawana. Um, and it's um, Kawano, Tomoyo Kawano, I'm sorry. Um, it's, there's an aesthetic quality that's brought into the research experience mm -hmm. that I think is something that is also missing from quantifying something or collecting verbatim words uh, to actually really, really, truly incorporate what, you know, I mean, something like, I, I, she and I go back and forth with, you know, how is embodiment, is that similar? Is it aligned with aesthetics? Is it, can it be separated from aesthetics? Um, so, you know, because of her uh, method, her methodology is so aesthetically aligned and you really can't separate embodiment from aesthetics in that. Yeah. Or, aesthetics or, are part of research. Yeah. I mean, so, so essentially you take the complexity and the implicitness of, of human interactions and the idea that they're impoverished when, uh, you know, they're cut into data. And so this adds, uh, you know, retains some of the, uh, the implicit quality, and obviously that's going to have an, imp uh, you know, an aesthetic dimension to it. Yeah, yeah, really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my uh, one of the proposals that came in, uh, honestly, I don't remember exactly what their method was that they were introducing, but they asked if they could somehow include a video. Uh, and I, I'm not really sure how to do this yet, but I hope it's possible. Either have like a permanent link, you know, if they can somehow create some kind of permanent link online that can then be just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, not embedded, but, uh, you know, put into the, the text mm -hmm. somehow. Mm -hmm. So that there is more, and as you and I are doing right now, you know, interviews are moving more towards video and interaction and, uh, you know, um, technology. Uh, so it, it kind of uh, is also very exciting to me that, you know, that even though it's embodiment, which sometimes you might think of as the opposite of technology, that we're starting, there's something about this shifting more forward into, um, mm, I don't know, I'm just saying this right now at the top of my head, like integrating or utilizing, finding some, mm, I don't want to say balance, but more integration of embodiment into technology. Yeah, yeah. Or, 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 or how, you know, what are the ways in which we can better capture uh, that experience of embodiment and that, um, you know, uh, writing and printing books are a technology and more modern technology uh, actually have some capacities that books don't have. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm, it just occurred to me just now as we were talking that that's something, you know, another uh, one of my own soapboxes is, no, it has to be in person or it's, it's not embodied. And maybe that's not true. Maybe that's not true after all. Maybe well, there's a way that we can move into the next century with, uh, with, with an embodied uh, experience. It could be a substitute. I mean, it's something that's not as good but yeah. um you know has some uh, some qualities yeah
Yeah. But you know, I'm struck as you're talking about this that ostensibly we made this, uh, you know, this we organized this conversation with the idea of talking about, you know, research and and embodied research, and actually. Um, what it's very much about, in addition to research, but it's about also, uh, you know, that what is it that we're actually studying, you mm -hmm. know, in terms of the human behavior, in terms of what happens in therapy, in terms of how therapists do something with clients, and uh, it's, it's in a way, uh, you know, even without talking about the research itself, I found this conversation interesting in the sense that it points out, it, it, it helps us as therapists pay attention to, okay, so, you know, what is it that we're actually doing? Um, yes. And then that a researcher says, well, if I have an idea of what it is that, you know, we're looking at, then we can develop tools to analyze it. Yes, yes. And so this, um, you know, this, this to me seems like scratching the surface. Uh, you know, I feel um, I, I'm taking something that I practice and mm -hmm translating it into a methodology, um, it's only the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't even say what would come of it. Um, it once enough studies are done using is it methodologies, who knows what can happen from it. So, uh, you know, and, and more and more as the, uh, the way in which we collect and analyze the data is closer to the somatic embodied uh, stuff that we are interested in learning about, the stuff that makes at least somatic psychology uh, and dance movement therapy uh, unique in nonverbal gestures, kinesthesia, uh, you know, proprioception, um, nociception, and how we experience pain or pleasure, um, those kinds of not clear things right now that we kind of take for granted and say, well, this is what this is in therapy can then somehow, hopefully, somehow, <laughs> through these methodologies, be codified mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and give us, uh, you know, a platform to work from. But so maybe that's a good segue into the idea of, um, you know, the, this, uh, the, what data do we gather, in what way do we get, gather them, you know, as yeah. we've talked about. But in a way, what's the goal of um, what kind of information do we want to get? You know, in quantitative research, we want to, you know, we get something like, uh, uh, you know, we have a, this tends to work with a 95% degree of confidence or something of that nature. Uh, what kind of information can we get through that and how is it useful? Hmm. Very, very good questions. Um, I'm thinking, you know, in terms of, let's say, you know, using the the current zeitgeist of this, um, you know, being aware of uh, social justice and oppression and equality and inclusion um, and, uh, yeah, those things. These are kind of, uh, there are definitions for them and every definition has a limitation. Mm -hmm. So to be able to use this kind of nonverbal felt sense, if you will, to use Jenlin's term, uh, experience, it gives a little bit more, um, and I think I have an example right now, if I may, from my sure. practice. Um, it gives a little bit more information to clarify what we're doing, I think you already just said this, they clarify what we're doing in clinical practice. And maybe, I don't know about codify, but perhaps find some, a little, something a little more tangible to, to work with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, I'm, I'm, again, off the top of my head, I'm going to go with uh, something that's been coming up in my practice. Um, I've been having this influx, and this is before Weinstein's thing. Um, I, I've had several men in their 50s coming to me and telling me that they're afraid to use their sexual aggression, meaning um, their, uh, 
in, in a positive sense, like sexual aggression, not not less devious way of being with somebody. But uh, there, for instance, uh, one man says, you know, when I see an attractive woman on the street, I like purposely look the other way because I don't want to offend her. And so this is very murky waters. This is very, um, and I feel a little sad, you know, hearing him say this because it is affecting his relationships and lack thereof. Um, so what if we find out what happens in his body? You know, how does he, what does, what's the sensation of shutting down? How does he, uh, how does he shut himself down? Does he say something? Is it a top-down experience? Is it a, a fear bottom-up experience? I don't know. Um, but this is something like, you know, we could do it in a, a psychotherapeutic treatment process. And, and all of a sudden, there's like a whole bunch of them coming to me with this similar thing. So I'm curious about what is it in them, and is there some kind of common ground in them that they hold back? And uh, in some embodied way, what is it that they do to themselves to turn back in or, you know, uh, distance themselves? Um, and what is that experience so that then, you know, we could find out what it is in research to then come back to and, you know, and write a paper about it. So then to come back to the clinical process and say, hey, this might be helpful, um, you know, to go to this place in their experience uh, to work with them, yeah, uh, yeah. to help them feel whole again and not shutting themselves down. So. That's kind of an idea. So, so you know, the words that come to mind as I listen to you are uh, sharing experience. Um, and, and so um, it's the equivalent. It's actually very much the idea that as a therapist uh, who deals with that or as a researcher who's interested in that, uh, looking at these situations and capturing the experience and sharing it with other therapists so that the other therapists have the benefit of that experience uh, in a hands-on way, in a, you know, in a way that feels uh, almost that they can touch, uh, you know, and can use it in their own practice. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, when Reich, uh, you know, came up with the bands, the bands mm -hmm. around the body, um, honestly, I don't know how much that was researched, but what if it were? You know, what else could we learn about those bands, and uh, rather than just kind of putting it out there and saying, hey, this is happening, to say, oh, this is happening, and this might be more in reference to one uh, emotional experience, this may be in reference to a different one, um, let's do some studies on this and find out what they mean for a bunch of, and it's, so now we're kind of moving into quantitative a little bit, mm -hmm. but to find out, like, what's the, the, the wider gist of what's happening in the body. I mean, it's just so unknown, you know, so not unknown, uh, but like kind of random right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. uh, to kind of go, oh, this seems to be this um, more frequently than something else. You know, I'm, right. I'm getting a little off, but. Right, right, right. No, that feel, that's, that's very helpful because that really gets a sense of actually uh, that that kind of research is also something that uh, gives um, the therapist as a reader uh, something that's more uh, of an instant or of a gut level grip on it in yeah. terms of um, getting a sense, if you want a felt sense of what might happen, a working hypothesis to explore with clients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that would kind of be a little bit more of uh, something that would facilitate uh, a clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And and then I'm thinking of another kind of example when it's something going back to the social justice realm. Uh, you know, what's the embodied experience of oppression? And, you know, how can that be, uh, be made aware or be made, you know, known so that the person experience it can can know it sooner and 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 change their situation uh, if poss 